Hi guys, so um, here's your loser stats teacher making you another video because we didn't get through what we need to get through in class. Um, I'm going to try and keep this brief. I really don't want to read over every little thing in this note sheet. Uh, and I'm being listened to by 15 pre-calculus students right now. So in any case, um, section 4.3 is just basically a summary of what am I supposed to be able to do with my results of my studies. So we did experimentation, observational studies, and then sample surveys as a subset of the observational studies. So scope means what am I allowed to do with this? Where can I go with these results? Or what do these results mean for some larger population or in general? And so um, we learned that for observational studies, we want to use random selection to get our samples. Uh, and for experiments, we want to use random assignment to groups uh, to eliminate bias. Both of these techniques eliminate bias from uh, our study. And so this table here is a good summary of um, the different combinations of things that can happen in your study. So um, random assignment, again, this would imply that you're dealing with uh, experimentation, uh, you know, and then random selection usually has to do with an observational study, but in this case they're saying you can randomly select individuals and then do an experiment on them too. So that's very, very unusual. But so what this is saying is, were students randomly selected? Uh, that's the question. And if the answer is yes, and the individuals were randomly assigned to treatment groups, then inference about the population means this. Okay, let me draw a picture to show you. Inference about the population means this. Here's my population. I randomly pick a sample. And this is my sample. Okay. And I observe something in my sample. And let's say, uh, you know, I don't know, something simple. Let's say the mean weight of my sample is about... I don't know, 150 pounds per person or something like that. Because I did random selection, uh, my sample is should be representative of the population. So I can say, go back to the population and say, oh, that 150 pound mean weight might be close to the mean of the mean weight, uh, the mean weight of the population. Okay, that can only be done because of uh, random sampling, random sampling. So this means random sampling here. And so um, this would be the best case scenario if I randomly sample people and then I do something and then I get a result, then I can take that result back to the population. Uh, in this case, um, I was assuming we do like a sample survey or we weigh people or something. That's an observational study. But we can do an experiment at this point and then if we get a result, we can take that result back to the population. So. This is highly unusual, but this is the most desired thing to be able to do. Um, randomly sample people and then impose a treatment on them by randomly assigning them to treatment groups. Okay, uh, And then next option would be um, just to randomly sample people. Okay, That means I can take my results back to the population like this. But uh, since I didn't perform an experiment, I can't say anything about cause and effect. So here, if I found a cause and effect relationship, I could take it back to the population. Here, uh, in this case, I can't because I did not randomly... Uh, um, uh, in this case, I won't get a cause and effect relationship because I didn't do an experiment. Okay? And then... Uh, the next thing would be if you do not ra do random selection, uh, and then you do an experiment. Well, that's usually what we do. Remember, an experiment, we have uh, volunteers. We do random assignment, okay, to treatment groups like this, and then we compare results in the end. That's kind of a quick sketch of your experimental design. But um, so there's volunteers. Volunteers imply no random selection, okay? So I did not randomly select people, all right? 
uh, then I cannot do this. This link is broken. I cannot go from my results back to the population. Um, so I just have this going on right here. Um, and then hopefully I can establish cause and effect. Hopefully I can establish cause and effect. Okay. And then finally, uh, if I do not randomly select people and I don't perform a proper experiment, uh, I can't do anything. Basically, the results I get are meaningless. Okay, the results I get are meaningless. So, uh, the first example is to try and illustrate uh, one of each of these cases to you, basically. So, I'm not going to read all that to you. You can go read that. You can pause the video and read all this stuff. Um, but And then you can, after you understand what it says, you can uh, push play again and uh, see if this makes sense to you. But it says here... Uh, patients were not randomly selected, okay? So I can't take my results back to the larger population. And it says uh, it was an observational study, no treatments were imposed, and there, were no, there was no random assignment, so I can't infer anything about cause and effect either. So all I know is that these patients who took vitamin C had fewer sores. That's it. Not very useful information. Okay, and then uh, <clears throat> design number two. Uh, this is a bit different because randomly assigning them to treatment groups uh, that lets me do um, that lets me do cause and effect. Right, so uh, the treatments were randomly assigned to the subjects, assuming that the experiment was well designed. Uh, we can, this is the cause and effect. Vitamin C reduced the chance of getting sores. So this is the cause and effect. But again, I can't take this back to the population because there was no random selection. And then in scenario three, uh, random sample of dental patients were selected and then I divide them into two groups. Okay, so this is a, a bit of a weird situation. So I randomly select uh, patients from the population uh, I can generalize the results of my study to the population. Uh, so in general, I can say um, I'm expecting that if people already eat vitamin C, they may have less canker sores, but that doesn't mean that there's a causation established. So uh, I can just say there might be some association, but it's not causation at all. Okay, And I can say that if the association exists in my sample, it might exist in the population. Uh, and then finally, if you randomly select dental patients and then do a proper experiment with random assignment, uh, then I can say that, you know, if I s see some kind of a strong association, statistically significant, I can say that it seems like <clears throat> vitamin C does cause a reduction in uh, canker sores, and I can take that information back to the population. Okay, and I can also generalize to all people in the population, all right? Uh, and then you can read, I, I'm not gonna go over all of these. I think you can read those two examples, um, talk about uh, challenges of establishing causation, lack, lack of realism, uh, things like that. Um, but I think the mo main thing I need to convey to you is that sometimes, um, ethics prevent us from doing experimentation. So we spoke about this when for smoking. Uh, I can't put people in an experiment to see if smoking causes cancer because that's harmful. We spoke about Zika virus. I can't inject pregnant women with Zika virus and see if their babies get microcephaly. So ethics prevent us from doing experiments frequently. Um, and so here are some criteria that's used actually there's way more criteria than that and um, uh, you know quite a few rules and things that people have to follow in order to establish causation without an experiment um, so yeah i'll let you read that but actually don't worry about this too much that's really a very complicated topic uh, and the, the whole uh, microcephaly and zika virus thing was a very complicated topic okay and so this gives you an idea that you can still come up with causation without an experiment, but it's it's pretty complicated. Um, and then ethics 
what this is talking about is just a little bit of an exposition of how ethics works. Usually when you do an experiment, someone's paying for your experiment, um, and you know they want your experiment to be approved by some kind of a review board or a government or organization or something. And so uh, you'd have to pass an ethics review by some kind of an organization. Um, and then, you know, if you're doing experiments, you must make sure that people are informed properly and adequately of what the experiment entails. And also, uh, if it's an observational study or an experiment, whatever you're doing when you collect information about people, uh, you must assure confidentiality. Now, uh, that doesn't mean necessarily there's anonymity, but there could be confidentiality. You can't uh, experiment on someone and give them a drug uh, anonymously that's kind of difficult to do so please understand the difference between these two uh, for us we want this usually anonymity when we're doing some kind of an observational study like a sample survey if we can because we're hoping that uh, anonymity will ensure honesty um, but um, confidentiality is also frequently something that um, is the best we can do if it's an experiment or um, you know if you want to know people's names because you want to be able to reach them to follow up to avoid non-response bias okay something like that um, any case so uh, also just remember that you know as a christian our calling is much higher than not being caught by a review board when we do an experiment we should be doing experiments with you know, the principle of love your neighbor like yourself in mind. We should not be trying to avoid prison, but we should be trying to uh, do things to help people and to be good stewards of the earth. So we have actually have a much higher standard than just basic ethics. Any case, something you could think about. Uh, I hope this helped you a little bit. If you have any questions, please let me know.